Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Payroll Protection Program and Your Nonprofit, What Now? with Quick Start. I want to thank our generous funders and today's sponsor for making this series possible. Quick Start, the Vermont Community Foundation, National Life Group Foundation, A.D. Henderson Foundation, and the High Meadows Fund. Today we are using the Zoom webinar, and you'll see it might look different depending on what sort of device you're using, whether you're using your computer, the functions may be on the, the lower portion of your screen. If you're using an iPad, a tablet, or a cell phone, your features might be in the upper right. So today's conversation will be recorded and we will send the recording out to everyone within about 48 hours. Today we'll be using Zoom webinars features Q&A and chat. We will have a Q&A section at, at the end of the webinar, but in the meantime, please feel free to use the Q&A box to ask any questions. You can also upvote people's, other people's questions. Please use the chat box to um, say hello and also to have conversations with other attendees or the panelists. So today we'll start with an introduction, then we'll move into the presentation from Wendelin. Then we'll have a short Q&A section followed by next steps. So my name is Morgan Webster. I'm the director of Common Good Vermont. And today we're joined by Wendelin Duquette, who is the president and founder of Quick Start LLC, an accounting services firm serving nonprofit organizations with consulting and outsourced accounting services. She's been a certified QuickBooks and Pro Advisor since 1996 and also a trainer with Common Good Vermont for our Finance Friday series and nonprofit summer camp. Thank you everyone for joining today. Today, I just wanted to say that we are Common Good Vermont and Common Good Vermont serves as the go-to resource for our sector to share resources, gain skills, and build partnerships. Common Good Vermont serves on the National Council of Nonprofits representing the state of Vermont and our sector here in Vermont. We serve alongside associations and capacity builders nationwide to support and advocate nonprofits across the United States. And I'll hand it over to Wendelin to say a little bit about her business with Quick Start. Thank you, Morgan. Um, I'm delighted to be here and I am um, delighted to hopefully have an opportunity to clarify a lot of what I think for many of us has been a fairly complicated thing to sort of wade through. Uh, what we do here at Quick Start is help nonprofits and small businesses develop um, clean, accurate um, information from your financials so you can make better decisions to serve your mission and goals. We really want you to do more good. Uh, what we do, our main services are um, file checkups, which is a pretty quick dip into how things are going, some consulting um, in these different areas. And then uh, we do outsource, we provide outsource controller services for organizations that need that level of accounting but don't want to hire a full-time person in-house. But on to today's events topics. So what we want to cover today and what we want you to take away is understanding, you know, really clearly what is the purpose of the PP loans, because it's pretty narrow and pretty specific. Uh, we want to clarify what you need to do to maximize your loan forgiveness, because we want you, we don't want you to have to give any of this money back if you don't have to. Uh, we're going to provide some tools to help you track your expenses, and we'll talk a little bit about the things that you need to be monitoring uh, from the moment the funds hit your bank. And we're going to clarify some um, why there's some conflicting information about nonprofits, and I'm afraid we're going to leave you with some gray areas to, to, to meddle with yourself, but um, hopefully give you some confidence in um, and tools to help you sort of sort out where you land on some of the gray areas. Um, and, and lastly, we'll provide some resources on, uh, for you to do more research on how to decide to proceed if you, if you feel the need for that. So the payroll protection program has a very specific purpose. It's first, it was for de designed uh, with small entities in mind. That is 
um, entities that are under 500 employees. And that is a straight headcount, full-time, part-time, how many paychecks are you writing in any pay period, which is different than its objective, which is to keep your number of full-time equivalents, your employees, they, they want anybody receiving these loans to, to keep everybody on their payroll employed. They want to keep people, uh, it, it was an eight week program designed to keep uh, a mass migration to unemployment. And so the FTEs is an important component of that. And that's going to be based on your full time uh, equivalents of 40 hours per week. So take the total hours that your employees, uh, you, you paid employees and then divided by 40 and that's how you would calculate uh, an FTE. The other objective is that they want uh, people taking this money to keep the amount of cash that, um, it, that they have been distributing to their employees going out to their employees. So they're concerned about the dollar amount you're, um, you're paying and um, in, in cash and benefits to your employees and they want that to be the same. So those are the two benchmarks that you're really gonna be looking for for the bulk of your forgiveness. Um, and again, the idea here is to keep people off unemployment, keep money flying, flowing into the economy, uh, whether it's through maintaining rent or for your employees to maintain rent or mortgage or the things that uh, they anticipated people having trouble with uh, as we work through this, uh, the challenging times. Most of you probably are aware that in order to get forgiveness, 75, total forgiveness, 75% of your funds must go to payroll and payroll related, certain payroll related expenses. But there is a provision if you can't keep Full employment for any reason, that 25% of your loan can be used for rent, mortgage interest, which I think is something that um, people aren't always clear about. It's not your full mortgage payment, but the interest portion of your mortgage and utilities. Uh, and we'll talk more about utilities. And then there is anybody who has been through the loan process knows that there is a, a, a self-certification of need. And we're going to talk a lot more about that too, because that's an area that's um, creating some confusion for, for organizations. Okay, next. I want to step back to give um, everyone here a, a little bit of an understanding about why there's um, a bunch of confusion and, and we're not getting clear answers around, uh, particularly around this, this this law. So in general, uh, not in general, the, the way laws uh, go from the legislative bodies and their administrative bodies signing them to implementation and the public's um, putting them into practice is pretty straightforward, but not always known and, and people don't always understand it. So the laws are passed by the legislators. They're signed by the administrators, the governors or the, um, the president. And then Usually, you know, some a law that be written now in the federal government may not be enacted till July 1st or October 1st. And in that interim period, there's a huge long process of writing regulations uh, where input is, uh, is solicited from and provided by affected parties. So in this case, you know, the nonprofit councils would be you know, putting information, it, typically putting information into uh, the, the people that are writing the regulations uh, about how they want to interpret the law itself. So there's a lot of, you know, negotiating of, of the finer uh, details through this whole process. Once those regulations are written, then it's left up to the public to interpret these regulations. Now, remember, this all got passed very quickly. There was no time for input very little time for input. And so there's the regulations do not have the thoroughness that we're used to getting. Um, and, and so that's, that is probably the core of why um, there's a lot of confusion now, because I, I think we're seeing on, almost on a daily basis, new clarifications coming out in the regulations, um, and we can expect more of that. Never mind what's going on with this law, in all laws, once the regulations are in place, there's, there's a, um, they're subject to interpretation. So in, in almost all regulations, there are items that are clearly black, clearly white, and then there's a gray area in between. Uh, and, and this is where there's, uh, you know, you can find different people having different opinions on what a certain piece of regulation means. And this is where we rely on accountants, lawyers, and other professionals to advise us. 
I want to take the moment now to say that I am not in a position to advise any of you on any particular interpretation for your organization. What I really want to do is help make sure that you have the tools to be able to ask better questions of your advisors um, as you're grappling with the issues that we're going to talk about today. Um, it would be impossible and inappropriate for me to give you specific advice. So we want to get to a uh, read from the organization can, um, about whether um, you've applied for a loan. Do you want to start the poll, Morgan? There we go. So if you can um, tell me which, uh, tell us which of these apply to you, be helpful for us to know, sort of read the room in terms of what, uh, where people stand in terms of the process of, of getting a loan. We've almost got everyone in, about 10 more people, if you could put your vote in. And this is your best guess too. So if you don't know 100%, again, just put your best guess in for your organization. All right, I'm gonna stop the poll now. And the results? Oh, okay, great. So almost everybody here has applied for a loan. So we'll focus on that. Um, I will spend a little time on whether or not you should apply for a PP loan uh, for those that haven't, um, just in case um, you happen to talk to other people that um, or colleagues that you think should be considering it, but maybe haven't as of yet. Okay. Next. So just quickly for, again, um, I have had people ask if it's too late, um, you know, the first tranche, uh, uh, and the answer is actually that it's not too late. There's uh, last count, May 13th, there was 1.2 billion still available, uh, but you should also be aware that the SBA lenders will also be making decisions just because the funds are available from a federal standpoint each lender will make individual decisions on how much they're going to process. So anybody who's considering it should check um, to make sure that the SBA lender they would typically go to still has funds. Um, the other thing that uh, advice that I've uh, had for people and those of you that found it troubling or challenging to find a SBA lender uh, is that the more um, you can rely on the local small uh, lenders that you probably maybe have a relationship with, um, that's going to be, those are the places where I think people are ha having the best luck, especially early on. And uh, it's a, just sort of a plug for um, organizations to make sure even though you may be a small entity or, or whatever, it, you have a banking relationship with a bank and, and part of the benefit of that is that hopefully you'll get better um, advice and service from them uh, if you're already a customer. Um, rather than coming in with no relationship. So um, foster those relationships and um, keep those strong. Uh, the other thing I want to say is that um, even for those of you that have received a payroll protection loan, be aware that um, most of us are probably aware that the, uh, the House of Representatives have already crafted a new stimulus bill that um, is probably going to get changed radically by the time it gets through. If it does, it probably will get through the Senate, but um, there's going to be a lot more negotiation on the next round of, of legislation than I think the first two, which, which they really wanted to get out. Everybody wanted to get out quickly. So there's more to be coming in terms of relief. And it's been um, pretty gratifying. I, I don't know of any other stimulus that's done as much for nonprofits. I could be all wrong on that, but I haven't. Um, this is, uh, to me, feels a little new. All right, next slide. Uh, these were just some interesting statistics uh, about Vermont loans in Vermont. Uh, so in the first round that went from the third to the 16th, there were just under $7,000 loans totaling just over $1 billion. And the average size of the loan was $143,000. Contrast that to the second round that's still being dispersed, but these statistics are as of May 8th. There were just over 4,000 loans, totaling just over, uh, just under four, uh, 205 million, and the average loan was about, a, you know, considerably smaller at 49,000. Uh, so I think that for smaller entities and smaller organizations that aren't going to be, you know, taking, you know, two, three, four hundred, two million uh, in in payroll protection loans. Uh, the news is there's still funds available and they are going out in smaller pieces, but don't wait forever. So if you know other people that are looking, um, 
that's the, um, the, the latest information that I'd share um, and encourage people to, to continue to pursue it if it's appropriate. Next. Okay, so we've received the loan. Now what are we gonna do? Let's, let's talk about the, the specifics of the timeline, timeline um, for forgiveness. So there is a hard eight week reporting period that starts from the exact date that the funds are being deposited in your bank. And I've actually um, talked to a few bankers who have said that they have been very specific <laughs> about uh, dropping money into people's bank accounts um, if they can, timing it around when they either just about to do payroll or whatever so that the money is available for that and that it to help just um, make it easier and, and, and get the funds uh, aligned with what their, already, their, their business cycle already is. So once you have the funding, you'll be tracking your expenses. And once the eight week period is over, you're going to have 60 days um, after that report, that track, that, that period that the money is to be used for to report back to your lender for forgiveness. And this is, uh, this is a piece to that, that wasn't completely clear to me, although it makes perfect sense. And some of you may already have figured this out, but you're going to be applying back to your bank for forgiveness. So they're the ones that are going to be handling the information. And so if you have questions about you know, forgiveness, probably the first place you're going to want to go is to go to um, you, you're going to want to go to your banks and find out what do we need to track. And I do, I do know that some of the banks have actually provided calculators. I know Miscoma Bank has provided several of our clients with um, spreadsheet calculators um, to help them keep tracking as they go along. And uh, we'll provide you with another one as well. So, um, and I imagine that Miscoma isn't the only bank that's done that. So the reason you're going to be, you want to read the promissory note, because that's the legal document that you signed in agreement with the bank, and it's going to spell out many of the terms that apply to you. And don't be surprised if it's different from somebody, a colleague at another bank. Um, each bank has, um, has, especially my experience in Vermont, is I think the banks have jumped on and been very nimble to, to get this money in people's hands and, uh, and tried to cut through a lot of red tape um, to make these things available and to serve their clients. So um, they, there may be some differences. Um, and it's my understanding that they are, that you'll be applying to them for forgiveness and that they may be the ones interpreting um, with some guidance what is going to be forgiven. But again, start with your bank first to make sure you know what you need to be reporting to get your forgiveness, uh, to get the maximum forgiveness. Next. So documenting forgiveness. Um, this is, again, something that you want to stay on top of. So um, you should already, if you've already received your loan, which most of you had, have, then um, you want to make sure that you're already poised uh, to track this. As I said, we'll be sending you a spreadsheet. Well, actually, if we have time, we'll take a look at it uh, at the end of the, uh, the presentation. So the first question that I asked myself and, and wanted to know for, for our clients is, um, are you going to be reporting on a cash or an accrual basis? Um, so the answer is decidedly unclear. <laughs> I have heard um, some people say it's going to be on accrual and I've had other people say firmly that it's on cash. Again, get back to your lender. But the thing that's important, whether it's going to be on a cash basis, meaning when you actually um, send the, the check out, the date you actually pay the bill or pay your employees, um, again, that's the, and that would be the direct deposit date if you're not writing checks, that the money goes out of your account, or whether it's on a accrual basis, which is the date that the, um, the in, of your invoice for health insurance or for retirement or for the pay period that the employees worked, um, it's going to, you're going to need to be consistent and, and you're going to need to check with, um, be clear with your lender about that. If your lender doesn't have any information, you might be able to talk to your CPA as well. Um, and we'll have some other resources through the SBA that you can, that you can um, do some research on that. But I think what's important, regardless of whether you're doing it on a cash or accrual basis, is you want to make sure that uh, for bills that are monthly, like health insurance, uh, most health insurance premiums, whether it's for dental, um, vision, 
um, health care are, are billed out on a monthly basis. So make sure, and this is really important, that you've paid two health insurance premiums um, in that eight week period. Don't um, let one slip and forget about it and say, oh, I'll just catch up next month or, you know, you want to actually have that cash or record that bill, you know, depending on your cash or accrual, you want to have record of that um, for two, two months in that. And also for retirement con contributions, most organizations that have a formal, um, you know, 403B or, or whatever uh, retirement plan will be making those contributions shortly after they pay their employees. So just make sure again that you're paying as much as you can within that eight week period um, in terms of what's going on. I think I've heard from some people about, well, can we pay extra? And I think the advice here is no, you can't pay extra. You should be paying what would be normally expected in that period. So don't up your retirement contributions suddenly or do anything out of the ordinary, um, but keep it, um, keep it regular and don't, don't get yourself in a position where you've missed a payment. The other documented expenses that you're going to be reporting on are going to be your rent, your mortgage interest, and your utilities. And same thing with the rent as with the health insurance payments. Um, make sure that you have paid both uh, two rent payments or mortgage payments within that eight-week period um, so you don't get left out to dry with, not, with only having one in case you need those funds to help qualify. Uh, in terms of utilities, the definition is um, decidedly unclear, but you should be tracking at least these things as potential utilities, electric, sewer, water, heat, telephone, and internet. And I'm not saying that these are all going to be allowable, but, at, um, but these would be the most obvious um, choices. I, I've had people say, well, what about Dropbox or what about uh, other cloud tools that you use? That's very unclear, but um, you know, make sure you have a way to pull those out if your lender will allow those and you find that you need them. All right, Morgan, next. Okay, so what do we do in terms of tracking this loans in, um, and you know, I'm, I'll be referring to QuickBooks, but the, the watchword here is don't overthink this. <laughs> um, if you have solid accounting, everything you need should already be available in your standard Quick, QuickBooks reports um, uh, and without any work. Um, I think the so if you're so if you're using QuickBooks and you're using an Intuit um, payroll product in particular, that it should all be there because um, your financial reports should be able to track your rent very clearly, your utilities, um, your healthcare premiums will all be posting to specific accounts. If they're commingled with other funds, you can parse them out based on vendor. So if you have uh, insurance with um, you know, workers comp together in the same, same um, account, you can filter or separate those reports by uh, vendor to get to the specific healthcare um, costs. And the payroll reports in QuickBooks, the payroll summary report is going to really nicely, you, you know, typically you'll see that laid out by uh, employee, but you can collapse it to get a total. You can include the hours so you can see in each pay period how many hours you've paid a total for your employees. And then you can, you can cherry pick the items that you are eligible to report. So there are other places that will have a very clear listing of the things that you can include for your uh, payroll forgiveness. Uh, but really clearly what is not allowable is your FICA, so your Social Security and Medicare for, the, uh, for the, you pay to your employees on their behalf. There, what is allowable is state and, uh, state and local taxes retirement benefits that you pay on behalf of your employees and um, and then uh, the health insurance premiums that you're paying. And if you don't use QuickBooks as your payroll processor, you should have access through if it's um, ADP or paychecks or whoever you're using, they should have more than adequate reporting 
um, through their um, payroll system to give you, again, the total uh, payroll broken out by different taxes and different types of payroll uh, items so that you can cherry pick again the things that you're allowed to track and not on the spreadsheet on a per pay, per pay period basis. The other thing that I'm hearing, um, and I'm actually hearing it mostly from banks and then clients coming and say, oh, well, we have to have a separate bank account. Now we need to switch to have all our, pay, our direct deposits come not from this account, but now from this account. Now we're going to move it back again. It's like, no, <laughs> that is not necessary. Um, the way you're going to be able to keep this, inf this information, this money separate is, is starting when the money funds, funds into your bank. And I do have some clients who have new banking relationships. So these funds did go into a new bank account and they do have a separate account. And that's okay if you have it, but you don't need to actually spend the money from this when that money is recorded into an exist any bank account, you're going to take that deposit and you're going to record it to a loan account. So this is not going to be recorded as income. It's money coming into you, but it is not income. That's really important to know. This money should be recorded in a loan account called PPP loan. And it should sit there until you get until you're told how much of this money you're, is going to be forgiven. So the bank will give you that information. At the time, and this is kind of high level, there's, you know, I'm not covering all the nuances here, but at the time that you then get forgiveness for that loan, you will then um, make a transfer from that loan account into an income account. And I would rec recommend that you call that um, debt forgiveness or something like that. So it should be an income account that's very specialized just for this. Um, many of you know they don't like to add income accounts, but for this purpose, I think it's important to be very crystal clear about what this is. Um, so you want that to go in as you will transfer. So if 100% of your loan is forgiven, then 100% of what is in that loan account gets transferred into an income account. If it's 50% of the loan, then only 50% of that money goes gets transferred into that um, loan forgiveness income account, but it's not until forgiveness that you're going to record the income. And then at the end of that, you'll have balance in what you have for your loan and you will then have to decide and work with your bank on whether or not you want to pay that loan off then because you've agreed internally that you don't want to incur any interest or if the cash at 1% interest paid off in two years is going to be useful for you for cash flow purposes. So it's really inexpensive money. It does have a pretty quick um, payback period. The, the, the amortization is only two years. So um, you have to make sure you do the calculations on that and decide whether your organization um, would benefit by having by paying that 1% interest and pay it off over um, the two year period versus returning it right away. It's my understanding, and again, you can check your promissory note, that the interest starts accruing from the date that it's deposited. Um, but I believe if your loan is forgiven, the, the interest that has accumulated on the forgiven piece will go away. So it'll just be interest on the piece that's not forgiven. Is there any questions on that? Is that clear? Um, so I will say one more, th uh, I'm, I'm going to back one more. So one last thing I want to say about the separate bank account. If you find yourself in a position, uh, so if you're an organization that does not have a very large cash uh, reserve, so if you're, if you have less than a month's cash reserve in your account and you're, you know, you feel like your organization lives sort of paycheck to paycheck, this is, pro this probably is the one exception where you may choose to keep a separate bank account um, just to impose some discipline on the use of those funds. Because uh, if, if you're in a tight cash, cash position and you have either the board or has decided they don't want to take a loan, but they will take the, the forgiveness piece, you want to make sure that you're in a position to be able to return those funds at the end of the period. Or if you get to the point where um, 
you know, if, if you're the finance manager of an organization and many people have access to this bank account, you don't, and you, the operating account, and you want to control who, or, you know, you want to put some controls on who has access to it, you may find for practical reasons that a separate bank account is going to serve you better than having it commingled with your uh, your operating account. So a little bit of a different reason for doing it, but it shouldn't be just because your banker um, says that you need to keep it in a separate account, in my opinion. Now, if, if your promissory note says you have to, then that's, that's a different matter, but um, not necessary. Gwendolyn, we have a question. Um, someone is asking, regardless, they're asking for clarification if their organization will have to pay for at least two months of interest on the unforgiven amount? Uh, yes, that is my understanding. Uh, but I, you know, with that, I would, um, I would not take that as gospel. I would not um, write the uh, transaction in your account to do that without checking with your bank. Your bank will be very, <laughs> they'll be very clear about the interest portion of it, but that is my understanding that the loan, again, the interest accrues from the time the money arrives in your bank and it's due on the portion that's not forgiven. Thank you. And then uh, another follow-up question. Uh, one participant says, our bank immediately deposited in, into our regular account and our accountant is determining it to be income immediately. Is this correct? I would say no. And I, you know, I'm not usually one to contradict an accountant because I'm not a CPA, but I, this is, um, this is a loan until it's forgiven. And it's, I'm pretty clear about that. <laughs> um, I would check with, you know, if you need some more um, uh, armament to go, go back to your accountant, I would uh, check with the bank, um, maybe check with another accountant, but that, um, you know, hopefully, hopefully it will all turn into income, but in, this, is, this is a loan. <laughs> And they're charging you interest right from the start. So I, I'm pretty clear about that. Thank you. That's it. For the rest of the questions, we'll hold until the Q&A section for now. Okay. Uh, so, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but there are a few things that will, um, there's, this is a special circumstance of, um, of payroll that will not be that you will not be able to count towards your uh, forgiveness. So the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, uh, Leave Act, for regarding leave. This this applies to, and I'm not as familiar with this, but I'm pretty certain this applies to um, employers who are required. There's probably an employee number threshold on whether you're required to, and I don't know what that is. But if you're required to provide leave to employees because they either one, have the coronavirus themselves, two, are taking care of a sick um, family member, or three, have uh, children out of school under the age of 18 that's impeding their ability to, to work full time, um, this act provides, uh, provides a mechanism for the employers who are required to pay this leave. So you have to pay the wages to your employee as you normally would, but they're offering um, sort of a, um, an in, not an incentive, they're providing a credit on your social security tax. So if you're paying this required leave, you get um, your 6.2% of your social security, employer portion of your social security tax will be um, forgiven. So you will pay the Medicare, um, that you'll pay out what you've withheld for um, Social Security and Medicare on, and, and withholding from the employees, but you don't have to contribute the 6.2% of Social Security tax um, that, um, that you would normally do. Um, so if you're paying wages, so if you're paying, someone was out for 40 hours and you've paid them you know, $1,000 for those 40 hours, and taking this, and you're taking this credit, that thousand dollars and the the associated um, state and local taxes that are associated with that cannot be um, included in your PPP uh, wages that you're looking for forgiveness. So the other thing that I don't know is I don't know if an employer has the choice about 
um, using this credit or using PPP money. You'd certainly want to get clarification on that. I do have a couple of clients who have um, about 25 employees who have asked me to set this up for them. Um, QuickBooks, if you're using the desktop with the assisted or the enhanced payroll service, has, a, uh, has payroll items available uh, for you to, to manage this. Um, if you're on the assisted payroll, which is their this payroll service, um, they will actually walk you through how to set that up. If you're on the enhanced where you're filing your own taxes, um, I, I can't speak to the quality of supports that you get from Intuit on that, but, but there are some FAQs on the Intuit website for that. Um, the, I can't speak to what um, Intuit is doing on the online version. I imagine they have something similar, but we don't, we don't use that with our clients. Um, so the watchword here is just be aware of this. Check with your accountant or your HR professional to make sure that if you have a choice, you, you clearly, if you have a choice, you want to just pay people during this eight week people period through your standard payroll. Um, and then um, because the, the benefit of forgiveness is far outweighs this 6.2% 6, 6 credit that social security. But again, I don't know if you have a choice, you may have to use this if it's, if it's required of you but it's an important piece to, to look into. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, um, just there. Okay, um, so, all right, so needs testing. So there are needs testing that have to, that were built into the loan because they wanted, as you know, many of you probably heard that the LA Lakers returned their loan because they clearly didn't decide they needed. There are a few other um, entities that um, provided, put, gave their money back. Um, and the two things that are um, important that, are, that were written on, any of you have um, done your application, you probably saw that you have to provide proof that you were in business on February 12th. That is the date that the coronavirus was first detected in the United States. And so what they're trying to safeguard against here is entities that maybe had closed or were just getting started up to, and, and just, you know, a blatant money grab. It's like, oh, free money for businesses that are in operation. And maybe you had employees last year, but you've closed um, and, and say, oh, well, let's, let's start up again and get some of this money. Um, so that's the purpose of the February 12th date. Um, and that, that date also becomes an important benchmark for, uh, for the needs testing on forgiveness for other expenses. So if you, uh, if, if in the eight week period that you're um, spending this money, you suddenly decide, oh, well, let's, let's uh, you know, move to a bigger facility or let's, um, you know, suddenly get, uh, let's get a, a you know, a fiber optic cable drawn into the building so we have better internet. Um, if you had those services or those rents in, on February 12th, they would be fine and allowable. If you do it during the eight week period or up to it, it's gonna be, um, you know, this is not money to help you expand your business or grow your business. It is purely sustenance. So the, the February 12th would be the date that they would look at, look at if, if they wanted to question whether um, something was new or enhanced or outside the scope of what they were doing. The other thing that you uh, had to do when you filled out the loan is part of the self-certification of need. There was, uh, it was, it clearly states in there that you are an organization that needs this, this money. Um, and I, the, I had a lot of conversations with almost all of our clients around, do we need the money? And there are lots of reasons that people juggled it. There was, you know, questions of, well, you know, we've got a pretty solid balance sheet. We've got 12 months of cash reserves on hand. You know, maybe we don't really need it. Maybe we should leave it for somebody else. I, and that is a really personal um, decision that I'm not going to weigh in on one way or another. Um, I will tell you that, um, the SBA guidelines, if you go to the, the uh, frequently asked questions, number 46 says, and this came out just two days ago, uh, that basically if you, if your loan was under $2 million, I'm guessing most of us in, in this Zoom room um, fall into that category, um, the SBA guidelines read this, and I'm going to read this, any borrower 
that together with its affiliates. So if you're a franchise, uh, or if you're an entity that has, you know, associated businesses within a shell or some kind of affiliations that receives a PPP loans with an original principal amount of less than $2 million will be deemed to have made the required certification concerning the necessity of the loan requested in good faith. So they're saying very clearly that you, by size alone, you are deemed in need. And this, this, is, this is a pretty interesting thing here. And I think for, for those of us that operate, especially in Vermont in the nonprofit community and in many of us in the nonprofit community, we, we sort of tend to operate from a, uh, from a position of scarcity and of resources. And so if you've been around long enough in different organizations, you may have worked in organizations that are clearly um, running hand to mouth, paycheck to paycheck, and you know, clearly have a need. And now if you find yourself in an organization that has a three, six, 12, 14 month cash reserves, your, your understanding of need may be very different than when you were in a, a, an organization or, or when you look at organizations that are um, running hand to mouth. And I think that while, um, you know, that's a wonderful position to be in and it does provide a great measure of security. I, I think they're saying really clearly that just because you're small, so if you're a nonprofit that's under $5 million or you don't have enough payroll to ask for $2 million, <laughs> just by that fact alone, you're vulnerable. So size makes you vulnerable. Again, this is part of the SBA. The SBA is there to specifically support small businesses. There's, um, so, um, you know, there's some vulnerability being small. So I encourage you to sort of rethink, even if you've got a strong balance sheet, um, what they're saying here and what that might mean for you in terms of your, um, uh, your needs. But what it also means for those of you that have the loans is you will not be asked to prove that you have need. So uh, if, if your loan is under $2 million, when you go to um, file with the bank, they will ask you for your expenses. They're not going to ask you to prove that you have need. Okay. So now we're going to talk about, I want to talk about the issues of uh, double dipping. Uh, and the issue here uh, is this is where I've seen, I, I've seen things. This is prob, this is where gray is really, um, popping up in a big way. I was on, uh, I've been on, the first uh, response I got was from an auditor on this, I, you know, because I've been asking every, every nonprofit professional I talked to about how they're viewing this double dipping or using um, these PPP funds as matching funds for either federal grants or other um, uh, restricted grants. And uh, a very reputable accounting firm that in the area that I've been working with was very clear. Um, they went back to their, they're, one of, they're affiliated with um, a large organization and, and they're clearly advising their clients that at the moment, there is no language that precludes double dipping with other federal funds or precludes your ability to use this money as um, match money for a federal grant. So that's one extreme. And then another, um, Nonprofit consulting firm attested that no double dipping is not allowed, just like any other federal funds, and you can't use it for match. So completely other sides of the spectrum. Um, and uh, Morgan, can you speak to what we the latest? Because we, <laughs> as early as this morning, as late as this morning, we were talking with the um, uh, the the organization that that common goods a part of, and they're, they're coming in somewhere in the middle on that. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that the National Council of Nonprofits, of course, you know, they're the most up to date in terms of what the federal regulations are, and then what we're seeing in terms of guidelines coming from local SBA departments and accountants nationwide. And they're more, they're more in the middle, depending on the area that you're discussing the double dipping occurring. Um, so again, you know, like we've said several times over this call, we're not providing, you know, legal or financial advice, merely tools to help you make some, some decisions and have conversations with your financial advisors and institutions. Yeah. Um, there's something else I was thinking about in, in regards to that, but it's, um, 
Yeah, it's a tough, it's a tough call. And I, so um, let me also clarify for those of you. So I imagine there's some or some of you on this call that deal with a lot of restricted grants. Um, so this language will be very familiar. This what we're talking about here is something you're used to um, making sure that you're, um, you know, that, you know, you know, 10% of your funds are covered by this grant. 10% are covered by this and that there's, you know, that when you add all the funds that um, that are available to support your payroll that you're not You don't have more than 100% of what you're spending. So you can't um, you want to make sure that you're using different things. If you're an organization does not have unrestricted does not have restricted grants. This is not an issue for you. Um, so this is just, you know, if you don't have restrict restricted funds of any sort. This is not an issue for you at all. You don't even really need to be concerned about this. And if you're an organization that has a um, has restricted funds, but they but none of them apply to payroll or to these other things, uh, rent and the other expenses, this isn't an issue. And I also have work with a number of organizations where they have, you know, they have some restricted funds, but 90% of their or 75 or 50% of their um, their uh, operating income comes from unrestricted money, um, then those there's clearly that 50% is up for grabs for the, these money. There's no question about that. Um, I think that, um, and then, yeah, so that, so that's, that's what, where this applies to. Okay, next. Um, again, just quickly, because most of you already have loans. Um, I, any organization that you come across, if they're they're considering this, um, I think that if they're expecting to maintain some or all of your employees, um, you should do. You can apply to this, and I'm actually going to. So, for all of you that are here that have this, um, I want to talk a little bit about the FTEs that um, you're going to have to report on. And when we get to the spreadsheet, I'll, you'll see this. Um, there is, so you you have the the regulations define two periods of time, and I can't tell you exactly the dates. I think one is from January till February 30th, and then I don't remember exactly the other, the other dates, but there's very clear parameters where you were, were or will be asked to determine the FTEs on your payroll. And it, you know, it might be analogous, I can't remember if it, if it aligns with exactly what you reported on the loan. I don't think it does. It may be a slightly different time period. They're gonna ask you to calculate your, your uh, benchmark FTEs. In order for, so the first test on your forgiveness is going to be, did I maintain our FTEs? If you did not maintain your FTEs, so if you had in the, in the period that you're going to uh, benchmark your, your starting point of what you had for FTEs, say you had 10. In the eight weeks that you're reporting, you will be expected to have 10 FTEs. They, can, they don't have to be the same people. They don't have to be... Um, um, 10 full-time people. It could be any combination of part-time, full-time, but it needs to be 10. If, for simplicity's sake, you end up with five instead of 10 in your reporting period, your loan forgiveness opportunity will immediately be cut in half. So it doesn't matter how much you paid to the people that were there. Um, half of your loan, it's my understanding, or and I, and I, I suppose I, it, it, it will be reduced by a percentage. My understanding is it will be a, the, the direct percentage will come from the, the difference between your original FTEs and the FTEs, your average FTEs during the eight, eight week period. So if you have a reduced your FTEs, you wanna really work hard to hire somebody else in. There are some, uh, there, are some allowances to make up your FTEs. There's some provisions to get back to your FTE um, count by June 30th, I believe. And there are some provisions for employers who had to lay people off, call people back, and people refused to come back because they made more money on unemployment. So there will be some opportunities if your FTEs aren't full for either of those two reasons. Uh, to um, maybe negotiate or uh, work with your lender to figure out how you can maximize your, your payoff. But I think the thing that's really important is that um, you have to pay attention to your FTEs because that will be the first biggest hit that will uh, affect your ability to capitalize, uh, you know, co convert this loan to forgiveness. The second will be the actual total amounts. So um, even if your amounts are lower, um, 
you're you'll still have, um, you know, you have your rent and your other things that can fill in if you need to. Um, the other thing for people considering about whether or not they want to apply or not would be, you know, given the amount that you think you can apply for, do you have the staff resources to apply and comply with the loans? Um, and then the recommendations of your accountant and lenders that you might be talking to. Wendelin, uh, we have a question for clarification. When you're calculating the number of FTEs that you have, are yep. you doing it based on your average in the last fiscal year for 2019 or before February 12th? So there, I, I don't have the answer. I don't have the answer for that. That answer has been clearly identified. And I think the SBA guidelines and the, um, the FAQs, you'll find that answer in there. There's, they're giving you two time periods. Well, there's actually three time periods to look at. One, if you're a seasonal employer, there's um, specific um, accommodations and, and calculations that you're allowed to use, which probably doesn't apply to many of us here. But if you are a, a full year round employer, there's, um, and I, I don't wanna speak about what the dates are, but it is clearly somewhere, and, and Morgan, I think we can probably look that up and, and send that off to people, because that would be helpful to know. And, and certainly um, look at both of those periods for yourself and choose the ones that's to your advantage. Um, you know, if, if your lending document allows it, because you would have had to reply, um, report an FTE at the time that you uh, filled out your loan, you would have assigned, a, uh, identified a current FTE for the loan application. So, um, so you know, we'll send you that information, calculate which is to your advantage, um, and check with your bank to see um, if they have anything, you know, if you need to use what you submitted on the loan or if you can use one of the other numbers. Thank you, Wendell. And just to clarify, again, we'll be sending out the resources that we're mentioning in an email and 24 to 48 hours along with the recording of this vid video training. Okay, next. So, further information on this double dipping question. So, let's assume you want to take a conservative approach and you want to reduce the chances of being called to task for double dipping. Um, the, clearly, um, many of you probably already figured this out, but in case it's not obvious, what, um, what you should do is you should be going to your other funders, not the federal government. So if you have a foundation that's supporting um, payroll, ask them if um, you can, if they will unrestrict the gifts. Um, we've seen a, a lot of um, the organizations I work with are finding that their, um, their, their funders that have sent money and have immediately just said, I don't care what we said this was for, use it for whatever you need. So if you have funders that are willing to do that, that would be wonderful. Ask them if they can extend the funds to use at another time. So um, maybe suspend the use of those funds for that eight week period. This is easier with foundations than it is with federal governments, but um, you can still call your uh, grant manager for state and federal funds to see if you can um, suspend the use and extend it and move it into the next fiscal year. If it's a, you know, at this point for state um, grants that federal state and federal grants that may end on June 30th, you'll want to, you'll have to extend it into the next year um, and, and see what they wouldn't do because you may find that they're more than happy to let you do that. Um, and ask if they, if they can use, you know, if you're unclear, ask the other, the, the, the foundation or the grant that has matching requirements, if you can use this money. Um, and, the, and then the last thing you can do is you can um, check to see if you can, uh, the funders will allow you to amend your spending plan to, uh, to uh, expenses that don't, uh, that, that don't qualify for the PPP. So some options um, if you're concerned about the, the double dipping um, that you can do, um, irregardless of what the decision here is, you can, you can sort of divert some of those funds in other, in other ways. Next. Thank you, Wendell. And I'm just going to jump in really quick. I have pulled up what the National Council of Nonprofits has just told us in terms of uh, double dipping PPP loans on existing expenses that are already being allocated to restricted grants. And I'm just going to read this verbatim for everyone on the call. Okay. It's perfectly fine to receive PPP loans based on employees whose wages may ultimately be covered by grants. They should be seen as a now analogies to taking out a line of credit. When it comes to seek forgiveness of the PPP loan, the nonprofit needs to determine 
if the PPP money must be applied to the grant covered employees salaries or if the funds can legitimately be applied to other payroll or operating expenses, recognizing that SBA's arbitrary 25% limit is still in effect. If the PPP money can be legitimately allocated elsewhere than grant funded salaries, most nonprofits are planning to not claim it in their forgiveness applications and give that money back or treat it as a loan. I was going to try to interpret what that was saying, but I don't think I dare do that. I think I'll let you send that <laughs> off. But it sounds to me like they they are um, they are asking you to be somewhat concerned about double dipping, but to, to to follow some of the recommendations we're talking about here. Uh, not to worry about it initially, uh, but in the reckoning. Okay. So this is the spreadsheet that we're going to send off to you to use. And I, you know, I'm sorry, this, I, I don't, it's, hard, it's hard for me to see the whole thing on my, let me see if I can, um, I might be able to make this a little bigger. So if you, if you shrink Morgan and I down, if you're in SIBO um, so that you can see a little more of this. Um, so this, ha this is a spreadsheet that, um, so when you, if you get this and you want to use it, uh, when you download it, make two copies. And the reason you're going to make two copies is if you start, then start working with one. And if you, what you want to do is all you want to do is input data into any of the, into the colored cells. You don't want to change any formulas or anything with the spreadsheet. Um, you know, if you're an expert on spreadsheets and you want to, and you feel comfortable with that, that's fine. But for most of us, you just want to let this sort of plug and play and let it do its thing. Um, and if you have a second copy, in case you, by, on accident, by accident, um, um, corrupt a, uh, a calculation, you have a copy that you can go back to that's clean. So that's just my general good spreadsheet um, etiquette. Um, the blue pieces, the greenish blue pieces are things, if you look at the lower right hand corner, there's a key on the um, lower section. Um, the green part is what you want to fill in. You can fill that in as soon as you, uh, as soon as you get your loan. And uh, this is, um, yeah, you can fill those in as soon as you can. Uh, you'll see that the, yeah, so there's the FTE averages on the right there for um, February, March, April, May, and June um, for 2019. The FTEs for um, January and February 2020 in the next column to the left. And then um, you are going to put in your, um, so you're on the far left green, you're going to put in your PPP loan. That's the amount that you've filed. And then uh, the forgivable amount is going to start calculating in the second column at the bottom. So um, this again is uh, a list of the, the uh, types of expenses at the top salaries and wages, payments for vacation, uh, severance payments, group health care benefits, retirement benefits. This is up at the top, Morgan, on the orange. Yeah. Um, state or local taxes and excess compensation uh, and then compensation to employees out the you cannot use this money for uh, employees that are <clears throat> that work outside of the United States so you'll just put these in I would immediately change the weeks uh, to the week of your you know the first week um, being the day the money the funds were developed and then I would put I would actually um, put the actual dates into the week columns there, copy it over to the right on the second column set of box of orange, where you're gonna be tracking your utilities and, um, uh, and rent pieces. So that's where that's gonna go. Um, and, and then it'll start calculating. You'll be able to see as you go along what's going on. And I would keep on top of this because that'll let you know how you're doing in terms of expected um, forgiveness and um, and will and will should provide most of the information that you need to track um, things in um, for your for your grant forgiveness. Thank you. Only other thing such I, a I great wanna, resource. Yeah, this was you know, I, um, yeah, this seems to be a really pretty good tool. Um, and it's actually to me, it's simpler than the one I've seen from Miscoma. The one from Miscoma is a little more complicated, but uh, but it also it also works. Um, we're running up to our Q&A section, so I'm going to move us on to the next slide. Yep. 
So these are resources that um, we've used. Um, one of the things I will um, say, the SBA morning, they're doing a morning update at nine o'clock every morning. Uh, Susan Mazza is doing that. Um, it's great. You should at least listen to one, maybe listen to one every, you know, once a week if you have lots of questions, but she's, uh, she's got a lot of um, useful information. I will tell you there are other people I talk to that disagree with some of the things that she mentions, um, but that, um, that uh, you know, again, everybody, every person who has advice has a different perspective. Hers will be from the SBA um, and they're available for that. Wonderful, thank you, Wendelin. And just to repeat, we will be sending out all of the links we've discussed, the resources we've discussed, as well as the Excel spreadsheet and the recording in 24 to 48 hours. So without further ado, we're going to move on to the Q&A section of the conversation. I've seen quite a few people have entered questions in the Q&A box. Thank you so much. Please enter one if you haven't already, if, if you have one. Um, there's also, there also should be a voting feature. If someone has the same or similar question, please use the thumbs up to, to make sure that you vote up that question. Um, and again, we just want to, you know, make a disclaimer that this webinar does not provide legal or financial advising, and we'll steer away from any organization specific questions and try to focus on more general questions. You know, as always, feel free to contact us directly if you have questions and we'll follow up with our contact information afterwards. So to get started, our first question is, can you give someone a raise during the time of the loan, during the time the loan is being covered? That, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked that because there is some guidance around that. So if you look and find that you're, you know, 10%, 20% short on, uh, on payroll costs, um, and you say, oh, well, I'll just give everybody a raise. No. If, on the other hand, you're coming up to the end of your fiscal year, and you normally would give a raise to somebody at this time, then you should continue to do that. So I think you need to do a, you know, would I be doing this otherwise is sort of the test that's been, um, that I've heard. Um, I think that's the conservative approach. I, I think if you find or you want to push that envelope more, I, I don't, so if you, if you use the test of would we normally be doing this at this time or for these reasons, whether it's merit or just annual raises at the end of your fiscal year, I think the, you're pretty safe saying yes. If uh, if you're um, clearly doing it or you're, if there's some question about whether you're providing this raise just to maximize the forgiveness, I think that's where you're going to have to get some more information from someone, uh, your bankers, your accountants, to find out how they feel about that. I, I can't render an opinion on that, but I think it does, it does push you from the, the definitely okay to the mm, I'm not so sure. Thank you, Wendelin. Next question, has there been any conversation about hazard pay increases made during the eight week period? Such costs are payroll costs, but would increase right. the average cost to, for documentation um, used to apply for the loan. Yeah, I, I, I think I'm gonna say the same thing. I think that um, I think that's a really important thing to be asking and I would um, document why, so if you have a increase um, because you're, you're uh, because you felt as an organization that a hazard pay was appropriate and important, document that. Talk to your um, talk to your lender about it. Um, talk to your accountant about it. Um, you know they're gonna as the regulations get written, they'll be reading those and and will have their own opinions about that. But um, I think that it's uh, I would if it was me, I would certainly be asking people about that question. Can we use it? Thank you, Wendelin. Next question, can we hire additional people and consider new compensation and benefits for forgiveness? Oh, that's a great question. I haven't run across that one yet. Um, you know, I guess I, I got a couple of thoughts on that. One is if you're hiring new people, my guess is you probably, even with the people that you had, you're gonna meet your forgiveness thresholds anyway, so you won't need them to do that. Um, if you're, um, if you need that, those employees, uh, those, um, so if it's, if your FTEs are the same, but you've hired somebody at higher rate, I think I'm going to ask you to just check with somebody on that. But I think that, um, you know, the intention, the spirit of the law is to keep people off unemployment. So if you're hiring people, I, I, I think, again, I think it's, it's definitely something I'd pursue, uh, but I don't have an answer for you. 
Next question. The forgiveness will happen in our next fiscal year. Is that recorded as income or net assets assets released from restriction? And can we use the PPP for given portion in the next fiscal year budget? Oh, I'm going to pass on that one. <laughs> uh, but I will tell you that um, it, that question in particular, so this sounds like a pretty sophisticated um, organization using their net assets to track, um, you know, restrictions and non-restrictions. So if it, I'm going to assume you have an auditor, and if you have an auditor, that would be, um, that's when I would absolutely call my, the auditor for my client to find out how they want us to handle it, because, you know, we want to do what they recommend, we want to, and we don't want any surprises when it comes to be an audit. Yeah, that's a great addition, Wendell, and that in addition to our lenders, the SBA, um, that we would also, and our accounts, that we also would consider our auditors as well. Yeah, well, I think that, the, so anytime, for anybody's here, if, Anytime I've said accountant, um, you can substitute auditor for that. Hopefully you have good relationships with your auditors and they're there to help you make, um, you know, record things cleanly. Um, the only advice I've heard from auditors that I don't agree with is they've, um, they've told people to set them up as cust use customer tracking for that. And, and again, as we talked about earlier, if you don't have any restricted funds, I would definitely not bother doing that. Next question, what if someone leaves the organization um, by choice, non-COVID related during the eight week period? Uh, so that will decrease your FTEs and you should try to hire somebody. Um, and if you don't, then um, check with, you know, I think, you know, if, if it's less than 25% of what you're relying on for forgiveness, you know, your other expenses may cover it. Um, and if not, it, it sounds like it's money that would be vulnerable. But, but again, talk to your banker and, you know, and explain the situation. Cause I think, you know, a lot of these things are going to be um, determined at a banking level. And 